So our family has a phobia that's unusual, but our whole family has it. Uh, put the picture up there. The fear we have, the phobia we have, is uh, called amexohydra claustrophobia. You're like, what the heck is that? It's the fear of car washes. You're like, what? You guys have a fear of car washes? I don't. My family does. What happened was one time my father, before he passed away, I inherited everything of his. So the car that I received from his death was a BMW 525 series that he got, I don't know, a couple of years before. And so we got this car. It looked great, but my dad didn't really take care of the car. And so I decided to get a car wash one day, and that is the day where the car died. And so Josh and Nathan both still believe to this day that the car wash killed the car. So when we got another car, and I said, I'm going to get a car wash, Nathan goes, Dad, I, I really think you shouldn't. <laughs> car washes are bad for the car. It just washes the external pieces. It kills the engine. I think the water goes in and destroys it. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Dad, it's true. Our last car, Grandpa's car, died because of a car wash. Sometimes... The way we think about certain things about our lives, these assumptions that we have, are absolutely not true, but we believe them. Sometimes you call it superstition. Sometimes you, you, you call it a phobia, but it, it exists. And when you apply these things to our spiritual life, we have a lot of assumptions about why our life and our faith are the way they are, and everybody has them. Stephen Covey puts it this way. He says, management, without it, read it with me, effective leadership is like straightening out deck chairs on what? On the Titanic. Management without effective leadership is like straightening out deck chairs on the Titanic. We all know what happened to the Titanic. The Titanic what? Sank. Sank. It was supposed to be the most secure Pure ship of all time, the most luxurious ship, but it was sinking. Just like my car, it doesn't matter if it got a car wash or not, it would have died that day. But we think that was the cause, but it wasn't the cause. So it doesn't matter if I fixed it. It doesn't matter if I, you know, greased it up or oiled it up or got an oil change or fixed the brakes. You know, one time I did that in college where I, I you know, got into a minor accident and fixed a whole bumper and it cost me $800. That's a lot of money for a college student, right? And the next day I got into a car accident where the car was totaled and I just replaced the bumper. Who cares if the bumper was gone? I was like, man, I should have just left the bumper. But how did I know that the bumper was gonna be gone? The whole car was gone. I just lost $800 and the car. And so, a lot of times, a lot of Christians think of their spirituality in terms of these faulty assumptions, which if not corrected, they're gonna, their trajectory will end up in a certain place. And a lot of times they have these faulty assumptions about certain root causes in their lives, why they end up where they end up. And so today, I want to look at those assumptions, correct them, rebuild them, so that God's destiny and God's plan, eternal plan for our lives, can flourish. How many people would want that? All God's people say? I mean, everybody wants God's plan for their lives. There are certain things that sabotage it. So today we're going to talk about changing the actual culture of our spirituality versus glossing it with, over, with things that actually is not going to affect it at all is a systemic issue that we're trying to correct, a foundational crack. So let's look at this text. So the, the parable of the sower that Jesus gives is found in Matthew 13 and also Mark chapter 4. It is a classic passage of four different people with an analogy of four different external or internal environments that affect God's eternal purpose or God's destiny for our lives to be fulfilled. But 75% of the soil or the external environment chokes God's seed or God's word out of people's lives and therefore they never fulfill their destiny in God's plan because 
their environments kill the Word of God. So the first premise here as we read this text, we read it already, is that, of course, the farmer or the person scattering seed is Jesus. He's the preacher. Now, I just want to tell you there's no better preacher than Jesus. Okay, he preaches better than Billy Graham and others and etc. He didn't have a doctorate. He never wrote a book, but he was the best preacher because he was God. You can't mess with divinity. (laughs) All right. But Jesus lost the most converts in history of Christianity. He had crowds, but they all fell away. So this is an empirical science. It's actually not even based on assumptions. Jesus was the best preacher, yet he was God in the flesh incarnate. You know, full of grace and truth, yet he lost more people than he saved. He lost his whole people. By 100 AD, there was only like a thousand Christians. So he wasn't very effective then in his preaching, you can say. Maybe if he was funnier, more engaging, you know, if he used a little comedy, instead of talking about, you know, hell all the time, you know, maybe more people would have believed. But what this text tells us, in, this, in verse 14 to 20 is actually Jesus' explanation of the parable, and I think it's very important. I call it the quadrilateral matrix. Say, tell someone that's what it is. A quadrilateral matrix. You're like, well, what is that? That sounds cool. Well, quad just means four. Okay? Matrix means context. Jesus is actually in this, these six verses, it's opening and and actually showing us what's behind the curtain of reality. It's like the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain, seeing that there's actually no magic there. The quadrilateral is an idea that you can use for many different things, but I call this the quadrilateral matrix because it shows you four versions of reality and how they end from the beginning. And the quadrilateral is simple, okay? There are just four. How do, you, how do you diagnose a problem? If you're a doctor, you have to diagnose a problem. If you're a lawyer, you have to find a problem. You know, you're a pharmacist, you have to find a problem. Whatever you are, if you're a student, you have to find the problem. The problem is the problem. That's what you're trying to solve. So usually, where is the problem? The problem is me. Tell, tell, tell someone next to you, the problem is me. But sometimes the problem is you. But then sometimes the problem is not me or you. Right? Sometimes the problem can seem like God. God, this is your problem. You're not doing this. Sometimes it can be God. And then other times it might not be God. It's who? It's the devil. That's the quadrilateral matrix. Where, how does it really affect things in how things play out in life? It's a classic case of the Matrix, the movie, okay, if you ever saw it or read it. I'm sure you probably watched it. It's a classic case of fatalism and determinism with free will. How, how, does, things, how does reality play out? What, what's the causes and the effect and et cetera? And so today I want to focus on me. Not the devil, not God, and not you. Jesus says, in a particular environment that we lose and forfeit the destiny God has for my life because of my choices. Because of what I allow to be around me to choke, what? The word of God out of me. I would like to focus on these verses from verse 19 or 18. I want you to read it with me. Verse 18. Still others like seed sown among what? Thorns. Thorns hurt. Hear the word of God. Hear God's voice, God's convictions, God's values. But, what does it say? But there's a problem. But the what? What is it? The worries of this life. And the deceitfulness of wealth. And the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Anxiety or worry is a choice, right? So what, what is the point of the parable then? The point of the parable is, put it up there. The point of the parable is what? Anxiety 
chokes the Word of God out of us. Right? It chokes what God wants to do in our lives and others around us to join Him to restore the beauty in all things. How many people like beauty? Raise your hand. Beauty, restoration, healing. How many people like revival? How many people like that? How many people like changing the world? Yeah, raise your hand. Yeah, let's have a revival. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love all those things. I love, the, I love optimism. I love altruism. Yes, I lift my hand. I want all of that stuff. But what about me? What if I do and join God, restore the beauty in all things, but, it, but what if I can't pay my bills? God wants me to be a missionary? How am I going to eat in Africa? They have no food there. It's clearly indicated by Starbucks that they try to give water there. What if we'll destroy the very seed that God tries to place in our lives? It's not determinism. It's not been determined how it will choke you. It's the environment around us that's going to choke us, and we choose to allow those things to choke us. What if? The condition. And check this verse out very carefully about the worries. And it says, Jesus says, but the worries of what? Which life? Of? Everybody say it with me. Come on, it's more. But the worries of this life. Which is to infer that this is not the only life. Which is to infer, but the worries of this life, not in the light of eternity, but in the light of this life life right now. See, America has changed. This generation doesn't struggle about retirement. You don't sleep at night, oh man, am I going to have money to eat when I'm 65? You don't worry about that. You worry about, man, am I, I going to miss out on what people are doing on Facebook? You look at Facebook, and you know that Facebook has a psychological effect in America, especially the first thing counselors talk to their clients about is Facebook. All the counselors are writing about this. All the psychologists are writing about this. They're like, well, what's going on? Someone, they sit in the chair. The counselor sits in the chair. I'd be a great counselor. What up? <laughs> you know? And they go, well, my friend's on Facebook. You know, they have these babies, and they have beautiful babies. They're in a pool. Oh, my other friend was in Paris the other day doing a, a, a fashion show. My other friend, you know, was in South Africa fighting injustice. And I'm just here at a cubicle. What am I doing with my life? Or then there's also, you know, there's also pagan marketing, too. You know, I saw Facebook, I saw my friend in a club, she looked like she was having a really lot of fun. What am I doing with my life? How come no one invites me out? So there is worry, there's different types of worry, but in this generation, I don't think the worry is actually an altruistic worry. I think it's a selfish worry. And the selfish worry is FOMO, fear of missing out. And so what happens is, we begin to be really work our lives and live our lives from the operation of scarcity. That's human economics. God's economics is not like that in the light of eternity. But we begin to count everything because we don't want to miss out. You know, I recently read an article about millennials. There's like a billion articles about millennials because millennials love reading articles. They don't want to commit to reading books. <laughs> That's just, you know, reading books is like long, but, you know, article, man... 30 seconds, I read an article, I'm going to take what I want out of it. Things of articles. The article said that a couple in their, their, their 30, 31, have saved over uh, $1.5 million in 12 years. And they quit their jobs to travel the world. And they're in South Africa, and they're in Latin America, they're in Asia, and they're, you know, and they're writing all about this. And people were going ballistic, it went viral. Everybody's like, wow, how do I do that? Because what I want to do in my life is do that. I want to travel the world. How many people want to travel the world? How many people would love it if that's your job? You just travel the world. Raise your hand if you want to travel the world. Just, you, you want to travel the world. Oh, you know, eat at Jakarta, eat at Thailand, try the real 
Pad Thai, you know, and you know, you, you, you just want to travel the world. You get it on a plane, you travel. Every, let me just tell you, I have a lot of friends that travel the world for a living, and they hate traveling. Just like us, we always want to travel because we don't travel. So there's a flip side. But this idea of missing out is so ingrained in us that it's very hard for us to be faithful to the present. That's why we're always looking to what if, these what ifs, what if I'm missing out on this event or that event or that life? And that's why millennials change their jobs like 55 times. I want to be a Brit. I want to work at Starbucks. Oh, they have health benefits. Oh, they give college for free now. You know, and then I, I want to do this. I wanna, they can't decide because this fear of missing out is so great. You know, anxiety robs you of being faithful to this present moment right now. This time in history. Because you keep worrying about what you're missing out on, you can't focus on what God's given you at this what? Moment. So what, what's really happening is, you're being robbed of the opportunity of development right now because what is the purpose of God? The seed, if, if God didn't want you to grow, if God didn't want your business to grow, if God didn't want your education to grow, your opportunities to grow, to represent him, why would he scatter seed in the first place? The rule of the harvest is that it will grow. If God, the Bible says, nothing can frustrate what comes out of his mouth into you. So if God spreads his seed, he wants it to grow. He wanted to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. But we, don't, we can't be faithful to his word because we don't really want to be at this present moment. We want to be in the future. When I'm like retired and I'm 32 and I have millions of dollars and, <laughs> and where I have no worries of this life, and I could worry uh, not about the future or the past, but I could just live in the moment, but in the future. You're, you're robbing yourself of the opportunity God's trying to develop so you can go to the future, but not be doing that. But doing something that's what? That would affect the concern not of this life, but eternity. So worry robs you of development robs you of this moment. It does. So, let me ask you a question. What are you, what are you worried about today? What do you fear, fear missing out? You know, th there's dozens of articles on millennials being the worst givers at church in America. Why? Because you fear of missing out. How am I going to go on that trip? How am I going to get my Starbucks? Millennials actually tie to Starbucks. <laughs> Why is Starbucks $50 billion? Because you tie to it yearly. If you accumulate the amount you spend at Starbucks in the end of your life, you will throw up because it will be your nest egg. You would have gave $50,000 to Starbucks by the end of your life. And Starbucks will love you for it. And you think you're cool with your drink walking down. Me too, walking down. Look at the Starbucks. It just made you poor. <laughs> if you took that $50,000 and invested it, from now to the time you die, you would have a million dollars or more. But no, I need the Starbucks, right? Because I'm missing out if I don't go into Starbucks and get my Frappuccino, my latte, my tall drink, <laughs> my grande, my venti. I mean, I need, I need it to make myself bigger and, and feel in the moment. You look at that, and it, it transitions to the anxiety of this life and why millennials struggle with this, especially with being generous with their time. Millennials are the greatest complainers in history. And this is the millennials' problem. I'm an artist, right? I am. I'm an artist. You guys just don't know it. Because I'm such a good artist, you don't even know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm an artist. And so I remember I, I did a project. I was speaking in Detroit at a preaching conference, and we were, you know, printing out some books and stuff like that that, you know, I was writing. And um, they were going to hand out. And at, at a FedEx Kinko's, we met a guy 
I said, oh, where are you guys from? We're from New York. You know, we're doing this stuff. He goes, can you take me with you? I'm like, why? He goes, I'm an artist. And he was working at FedEx. And so he's at FedEx looking at the pictures, looking, you know what you guys could do? You guys could do his, their suggestions. I'm like, I don't want your suggestions, bro. But he's giving me suggestions. But, he, but, but this is the classic case of millennials, right? You know, you have Photoshop. You have Adobe. You have Final Cut. You have all the tools. You go, I can do what Spielberg does. Sorkin, he's nothing. I can do that. Just give me an opportunity. Why am I stuck here at Kinko's when I should be directing Hollywood films? Isn't that pro- problem millennials? Always never being at the present. I, no, I can't be at Kinko's. I'm too good for that. I'm too good for Starbucks. I should be directing Hollywood films. Right? Isn't that, isn't that problem with millennials? And so, even at the church, this FOMO affects how you give, how you're generous with your time, how you're generous with your finances. Pew Research clearly shows that millennials don't, they tied maybe 1%, Christians tied 1% of their net giving. This is net, not even gross. A very few percentage in the church tied gross because they feel like if they tied gross, that would be really gross. <laughs> that would be grossly gross. And uh, I mean, but I want, I want to make this straight. Not tithing gross is not a sin in terms of technicality. But, I mean, when, you, when someone asks you, how much money do you make? You don't go, I make, I make 50000 You don't tell them your net, I make 60000 You don't say, I make 42000 after taxes. You go, I make 61000 or I make 100000 You don't say, well, yeah, I make 50000 after, yeah, that's what I really make, right? You don't, you don't say that to people because that sounds worse than it is. So when you tithe, why do you tithe net? God gave you 100000 then you need to tithe 10000 Well, because that's too much money. Then I wouldn't have this, and I can't go to Cancun next week, and then I can't buy Starbucks every day. Right? It's FOMO, classic FOMO. But you, you look at this context of what God is trying to accomplish in us as people of God, and why we fail to get that seed to grow in us is simply because we have this great misunderstanding of God's purpose in our life. We can't be faithful even, I mean, let me just tell you, if you can't be faithful to 31,000, you definitely can't be faithful to 100,000. Therefore, you'll never get to 100,000. If you can't tie 31,000 gross, you're never going to be able to tie 100,000 gross or 200,000 gross. That's never going to happen. And you go, well, where's the technicality in the New Testament? How does that work in biblical, biblical way? Well, simple. The Bible says no one should give under compulsion. You, everyone should be a cheerful giver. How many people are cheerful givers? <laughs> no, because if, if, the more I give away, I worry about what I'm limited, my mobility can do. But the problem with this is that how could Old Testament people give more than the New Testament people? How could people without Christ give 14%, which is traditionally the tithe in the Old Testament, and how could the New Testament can't even give 10 gross? Well, how could, after Jesus died on the cross, Jesus didn't give 10% of his blood. Jesus gave 100% of his blood. Jesus didn't withhold the incarnation. He 100% became human. He didn't withhold himself. He was a generous God. So how could then Christianity in our generation, and I'm not just talking about you, but everyone, how could then we come to a conflict where we struggle so much with anxiety of what I'm going to miss out on that I can't be faithful to what God has already given me now. That's a problem. I'm going to blog about this. <laughs> Stay tuned. Being faithful to the resources that God has given you today. If you can't be faithful with the resources God's given you today, forget destiny. Forget it. You should, honestly, this is, I'm telling you the truth, if you're at net, then you should work toward gross. If you're at gross, then you should work toward being grosser gross. <laughs> because the whole point is to be a blessing and to what? To join God to renew the beauty in all things. That's why he's preaching, to renew the world, to restore the beauty of all things. So stay tuned, but here, about faithfulness. So, so watch this. Then we go to the deceitfulness of wealth because we think of our, our scarcity, so we think the very simple solution of Defeating scarcity is abundance, right? So if I had enough, 
This is the common assumption of a lot of people. You see, when I get there, you see, Pastor Sam, I'm not messed up. You see, because you don't know, I'm being faithful to God. I will be, I promise you, I will be faithful to God when I make a million dollars. When? Dude, when you say when, I go, you're never going to make a million dollars. You're never going to make a million dollars because you're going to be faithful here. How are you going to make a million dollars then? How? You're making a promise on what you're breaking today. And here, here's, here's the catch. Let's, so th- this is the danger of the parable here. The danger of the parable Put it up. This idea of prosperity. Let me tell you how hard it is to get rich today. Do you want to know how hard it is to get rich? Because everybody wants to get rich, right? If you want to be rich, raise your hand if you want to be rich. <laughs> I want to be rich. I want to be successful. I want to be famous. I want to be a billionaire. Let's see. The government hates you. <laughs> Uncle Sam doesn't like you. Okay? Your job doesn't like you either. Okay? Your boss has another boss, and that boss wants to make more money for the company, okay? Here's basic logic of what happened with American economy from 1950 after World War II. The common wage, the median wage of a male salary in 1950s, guess how much it was? Someone give me a number. How much? $55,000. Wait, is 55000 the median salary today? No. 1950 salary, a male salary was $55,000. Do you know how much pizza was in 1950? 10 cents. How much is pizza today? $5 in Manhattan without tomato sauce. <laughs> how much is the median salary today? 31,000 or 38,000, whatever. You want to inflate it. Here, here's the economical lesson you have to learn. The U.S. government is more afraid of deflation than inflation. You're like, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> deflation is me not spending money because I believe the prices will go down. This is why inflation must keep rising. Eh, the, this is the law of economy in the global economy. All the prices will eventually go, what? Up. But how is the prices all going up and the median wage is always going down? Shouldn't, if the inflation is increasing and everything, pizza's $5 and the guy in 1955 could pay 10 cents for that, he was richer than you. Based on the cost of living. And here's the deceitfulness of wealth, okay? Okay. Already, we're working on a, on, on a concept of scarcity. America, we, you know how much we pay in debt per year to China? Okay, I'm exaggerating. 40, 40% of every dollar you pay in taxes goes to debt. Every year, you see the, the, the red side and the blue side, they meet together to see if they can raise the debt again of how much we can raise, how much we can lift up. Because we're trillions dollars in debt. Can we pay it off? Can we pay it off? No, we can't pay it off. How many people would feel really great if your taxes rose from 50% and you're single to 90%? <laughs> How many people would feel great about that? I would. I would love it. But we could solve our debt problem then, but then you would be living in poverty. <laughs> and so then news media recently are talking about Donald Trump. And I have to talk about this. I avoid politics, but I gotta talk about it. Because news media talks about how, why they can't figure it out. Everyone, everyone in New York is scratching their heads. Why Donald Trump is leading in the GOP. He sounds like a wrestler. He says ridiculous things. He's obviously not progressive in any way. Social issues, I don't mean, I don't know what he's talking about building a wall. <laughs> I mean, you know, every comedian is going nuts over this. What is Trump's appeal? I want you to re- read this, wor- th- this word with me, and I'll tell you what. But the worries of this life, but what? The, the deceitfulness of wealth. Let me tell you why Trump is appealing to America. Because he's rich. Very, very rich. And he tells, of course, every day how rich he is. He goes in the news media and he says, I'm richer today than I was yesterday. That's how good I am. 
He talks about how good he is. And the truth is, America is built on that philosophy of the American dream. You know when the American dream was invented? I feel like going, being a historian today. American dream was invented in the 1950s, after World War II. You know why? It was invented by a company named Fannie Mae. You know what Fannie Mae does? They let people borrow money. What happened was, in 19, 19, after World War II, America became a superpower because as the 16 million men away to, to work, all the women took over every other job in the Industrial Revolution. So when they came back, all the women didn't want to go back to washing dishes and changing diapers. They wanted to feel important too. And they told their husbands, I could do it better than you. <laughs> and the husband says, great, now we could have two cars instead of one. We can move from these apartments with rats and roaches, and we can move to the, we can move to the suburbs. Then that was called the American dream. Fannie Mae started an advertising campaign of a white picket fence. All America, of course, got TVs by then with color. So they saw the life you can have in the suburb, being Stepford, you know, having baking cookies, and having two cars, having two houses. So Fannie Mae said, hey, why, just, why buy your house with cash? That's stupid. You should get a mortgage. And so the American dream began. And then what happens when you, you know, have a neighbor next to you and you guys have the same exact house? It's called competition. And so they got this Cadillac that was a convertible. And so Mr. Jones was like, nah, chill. You're not going to have a convertible. I'm not going to get a convert. I'm going to get a convertible. And then a new system happened called keeping up with the Joneses. So it's not enough anymore to just have this white picket fence and flowers and apple trees and two cars. Now we got to get every kid to college. We got to pay it off. And the stock market. People start. So let's start investing this two incomes. Because now the women work and the men work. And everybody started about it, buying houses like crazy until 2007. From 2007 to 2009, the credit card debt or home equity loans went from $50 billion to $240 billion. Because all the banks would say, hey, you guys have so much money in your property. Why don't you take it out and buy stuff you don't need? Buy, no, they go on vacation. You wanted to travel the world. Now you can. You're so rich. Until what? Came tumbling down. People lost homes, their lives, everything they worked for in their whole entire lives. Because that's the deceitfulness of wealth. It makes you sidetracked from what? The present. It may, <laughs> what wealth does, it gives you every way of being distracted of the present, of buying things you don't need. And I admit, I'm distracted by this. You know, I like Ralph Lauren better than Old Navy because I'm deceived and I'm a sucker. I'm wearing Ralph Lauren right now. But I bought it on sale, so I got them back. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? The, the, whole, the whole conspiracy is what wealth and the economy does. It, it, it influences to... Keep up with the Joneses, and when the Jones really don't exist, the person, I made that up, they don't, there was no Jones. Keeping up with the Joneses is being shaped by what others see you as. To buy things that you really don't need, it, wealth and the deceitfulness of wealth robs you of your purpose and your destiny in the world. And so money, the love of money, Paul says to Timothy, is at the root of all evil. Paul says that wealth and the deceitfulness of wealth makes people lose faith and wander from Jesus. So this idea of prosperity, if I had more, I had more, then I would be secure and I would be happy is a lie. So, that this temptation of prosperity robs us of the present. It hijacks us. So let me ask you a question. 
What do you say right now to yourself? Not anxiety, what if. What do you say right now about your life? Only if. Only if I had. Only if I could do this. Only if. See, only if never changes. It just gets bigger. What if at this present moment, as the Word of God speaks to you about what He's given you now, here's a, here's a great idea. How about we be grateful? How about we be grateful? Not that we have to walk eight hours a day to school, like in Africa or in other parts of the world. There's kids in NYU that even won't walk to here. It's too far. Because the preference, the mobility, rots the soul. We can be thankful that you can eat whatever you want, anytime you want, really mostly all the time you want. The, tr the truth is you're rich now. If you can go to Starbucks, you're like 99% richer than everybody in mostly in the whole world. You even know what Starbucks is, and if you got more than one drink at Starbucks, then you're super rich. It's just that the Joneses tell you you're not rich enough because you don't have a Porsche. Right? After the Porsche, then there's other things you can buy, like planes. <laughs> but I, I checked, uh, did the research, people who buy planes usually go broke. Even though gas prices went down. And then you buy planes, and then you buy lands, and then you buy islands. <laughs> and now islands are not enough. You have like, you know, Tesla, they want to buy space. <laughs> they want to build stuff in space. I mean, it, it, never, it never ends, never stops. You know, I remember my moment when my father gave me a great inheritance and I made a tremendous amount of money in the stock market. It changed me at one point in my life. And it, everything in my life looked smaller in 2006. You know, the, the money that he gave me to buy a house with, you know, it has three floors, 2,000 something square feet. There's even floors we didn't use. There are rooms I don't even use. I don't even go to the third floor. I don't even know what happens. My wife said, why don't you come up to the third floor and see what I've done with it? I'm like, ah, it's too far. <laughs> I don't want to climb another floor. I don't want to even get the remote. Get up, get the remote. You want me to go to the third floor? But it doesn't. I'm like, you know, this house looks a little too small. You know, this yard looks a little too small. You know, this TV looks a little too small. You know, this car looks too small. Everything looked too small. Why? Because when you begin to have mobility, everything, you get tempted to get bigger and better. After the recession, after everybody lost everything, I looked at my house, it looked so big from outside. Yeah. Like, wow, this house is so large. That's three floors. Heartful. Oh, I could barbecue out here. I could cook steak out here in the concrete jungle. I could come preach here. Just, it only takes 40 minutes to drive out of here. A heart's full. It's all a matter of perspective, folks. If your heart's not full now with what God has given you in this present moment, your hearts will never be full. That's the deceitfulness of wealth and anxiety. Be present at this moment to the people around you, to the church around you, to the community around you, to the world around you, and be faithful. Be faithful. And that God will make you fruitful and maybe even successful. Let's stand and pray together. If you can't be faithful with what you have in your hands now, why would any father put any more in your hands later? This is the idiocy of the deceitfulness of wealth and mobility. You know, I pray that you become rich. I would love it if you became rich. Well, only if you could be trusted with it in God's kingdom. You see, faithful people don't even want more. They're grateful with what they have. Every time they get more, they're just like, oh, why, why do I don't need this? And God's like, that's why I'm giving it to you, because you're going to give it away. You're going to join me, restore the beauty of all things. God is calling us to faithfulness right now, not tomorrow, right now.
Let's make this our prayer. Lift your hands with me and make it your prayer. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I What you want from me So take my heart And form it Take my mind Transform it Take my will Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Let's make this our prayer. Faithfulness is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is what you are. Father, we come before you to this afternoon and we thank you and, and pray, God, that you would work in our hearts, that the word of God would go deep and take root and we would create good soil for the destiny of God in our lives to come to fruition, that whatever you've planned for our lives in joining you in your cause of this world, we would do it with a full heart. That our heart would be full. And when our heart is full, we give, we bless, and we don't preserve. So tell God, help me, God, be faithful to the opportunities I have in my life now the job I have right now, the resources I have right now, the people I have right now. Some people are like, God, if I just had better people, I would be a better person. Will you bow your heads for the benediction? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. All God's people say, God bless you. Go in peace.